and welcome back. And before we dive into today's main topic, I want to get you guys' opinion on some things. I've been doing a bit of rearranging in the room, and some of it I'm still having mixed feelings about. Uh, the first part, I'm actually quite happy with how it turned out, and that has to do with the UE1. I took the lower board and moved it over to sit to the right of the main board. Uh, I really think this enhances how easy it is to see everything, but uh, also this I had to do this to make room for the Bendix typewriter. I ended up getting the appropriate numeric control typewriter for the Bendix G15, but it has this bonkers 28 inch platen on it, and there just wasn't a good place for it. And and I think it looks absolutely epic sitting right there. And ultimately, below this typewriter, I think I'm going to put a Model 15 teletype that will hook up to the UE1 and be the primary output for it. So that's, I'm really happy with how that's coming together. It's this part over here that I'm still having a little mixed feelings on. And uh, what drove the reorganization of this area over here was the Litten. The Litten is this awesome mini computer that I've been dying to dive into, but it's incomplete. We don't have any way of getting input and output into it. It needs a teletype. And I don't have the actual appropriate teletype that would have come with the machine, but I do have an IBM Selectric Composer, which I'm pretty sure I can modify into working as a teletype. But I needed to get that Selectric Composer into this room, and it is massive. It takes up a huge amount of space. So in order to keep those two paired together, I moved the Litten over to the left, and I put the Selectric Composer above it. But what this unfortunately means is that the NEC PC8001 and the Wang Rider no longer have a good place to live in the room. And that's kind of painful. I really like both of those systems, but uh, man, I, I haven't used either of them in a while, and I don't really know where to go with the Wang Rider next. And so if it's not a project that I'm actively working on or planning on actively getting to soon, uh, well, it needs to make way for other projects. But, uh, well, you guys have been seeing some B-roll of how everything is laid out here. If you have a better idea of how to lay things out so I can get those machines back in here, definitely hop in the comments and let me know. But that's actually completely unrelated to what we're working on today. Today, we're all about oscilloscopes. And this is my HP 150A. I absolutely adore this scope, but it has one massive problem. And that is that it is massive. <laughs> It weighs so much, it almost throws my back out every time I have to move it around. And last time we were using this, it did actually uh, fail on us. We had it turned on, and then all of a sudden it shut off, and there was zero life coming out of it. And uh, it turned out it was just a blown fuse. I replaced the fuse, and it turns on and works just fine now. Now, why did the fuse blow in the first place? Well, uh, I don't know. Most likely, it's just it was a 60-year-old fuse. I never replaced the fuse. It's a fuse that was in it from who knows however many years ago. Fuses do get old and sometimes they blow. But we'll keep an eye on it. If it pops the fuse again, we know that there's something more sinister going on. So I am not actually going to work on this today, but I am going to use it to work on something else. I was lamenting about the fact that it's so heavy it throws my back out, but I love that it's an all vacuum tube oscilloscope. And I was uh, talking about this to a good buddy of mine, Chris Falla, and uh, he said, you know, I've got, I've got an HP oscilloscope that's all tube and won't throw your back out. I said, are you interested in it? And I said, well, I'm not, not interested in it. Of course I'm interested in it. So Chris, being the legend that he is, hooked me up with this little guy right here. This is an HP 120B. Chris has had it for a couple of years, many years. I'm not entirely sure how many. Chris, sound off in the comments below to let us know the full history of this machine. But it currently is not working, and the goal today is to get it working. It is a little dirty, as would be expected from a oscilloscope that's 60 years old. So we're going to pull it apart, clean it up, fire it up, and try to get this thing up and working. So I think we can get this thing across the finish line and looking absolutely beautiful today. So we got a lot of work to do. Let's just dig into it. First things first, let's make sure that the test equipment that I'm gonna to use to troubleshoot the 120B is all up and working correctly. Uh, the 150A here, fully vacuum tube oscilloscope, should be working perfectly. It's on and running now. The 200CD is a fully vacuum tube uh, wide range oscillator. I have it set to about uh, 10 kilohertz right now. 
Um, so let's see if we can pick up the trace on here. And I've got the uh, 150A set to B only. So if I flip it over to A, it's a tiny little sine wave. Let's change our volts per centimeter to make that a little bigger. There we go. Let's line that up right in the center and then we'll adjust it over to get a nice shot of that sine wave. Look how gorgeous and absolutely solid that is. And then I can change the amplitude of that sine wave using the amplitude knob on the 200 CD here. And you know what? I think that's all working uh, perfectly. So let's move over to the 120B next. All right, the 120B is plugged into the wall. These old HP scopes all use uh, really nice Sprague caps, so I'm not worried about one of those being shorted. I've never come across one of the Sprague can cap capacitors being bad. Uh, so I'm just gonna flip the power on and uh, send it and see where we sit. And the power's actually on the intensity knob here, so we just flip that. Turn the intensity up. We can see that we have uh, a power light coming on. All of the filaments should be warming up, even though I can't see them. And um, well, I've got the scope probe plugged in. We should be seeing some life here, but we're not. Uh, let's maybe move this stuff around. Oh, look at that. We got a little bit of life there. It looks like our horizontal sweep is having some issues. Uh, if I change that, oh, oh wow, look at that. Okay, there's a hundred millivolts per centimeter. Our position is awfully low. Uh, okay, that's that's almost there. <laughs> the potentiometers in this thing are filthy. There we go. Uh, boy, it just looks like we have a uh, triggering problem maybe. It's not showing up as a perfect... Oh, hey, there we go. Yes. Oh, wow. Look at that. It's pretty much functioning. Uh, but as you can see, every time I touch one of these potentiometers, the whole thing goes absolutely bonkers. So we need to just pull it apart, give it a serious deep clean, and then uh, give it another test and start troubleshooting from there. To get this thing open is a cinch. There's just four screws on the top panel and then it slides back just a little and then it pulls right up and out. And just look at the insides of this thing. Very similar construction techniques to the HP 150A with tube sockets mounted directly to PCBs. I love this little diagram on the transformer as well, outlining all the different windings. And what what's this? A little bit of germanium PNP wizardry in my tube scope? And it's got a friend in the form of a Zener diode. That's right, this isn't a pure tube oscilloscope, it's a hybrid. The transistor is a 2N301 PNP power transistor used in the heater regulator circuit. This circuit creates a DC heater chain to power the filaments in the vertical and horizontal amplifiers. This helps keep 60 Hz noise from finding its way into sensitive parts of the scope. The Zener diode is also a part of this circuit and it's a 1N2983B 10 watt 18.7 volt Zener. I believe it is used as a regulator in this circuit, although the layout of the circuit is very strange to me. I'm not sure how the PNP and Zener play off each other, so if this makes sense to you, uh, let me know in the comments below. At any rate, let's get the bottom panel off, and it's just four screws as well, then it slides back just like the top and comes straight off, giving us an amazing view of the PCBs. Serviceability on this thing is absolutely staggering. Just look at how accessible everything is. And I absolutely adore these hand laid fat traces on the early HP PCBs. At the back, we can see the two rectifiers and transformer that are part of the high voltage generator for the CRT. Next, I wanna clean all the tubes since they're coated in a fine layer of filth. I like to remove tubes from sockets by rocking them back and forth and slowly working them out. Unlike the 150A, there aren't actually all that many tubes in this one, and they're all pretty accessible. With all the tubes out of the way, let's pull off the side panels for cleaning. They're also held on with just four screws, and then they come right out. This one on the other side literally fell out as soon as I removed the last screw. 
Uh, moving to the front of the scope, this CRT bezel is going to need some cleaning as well. And it's held on with four screws around the periphery. Then it falls right off, giving good access to the CRT, which should make cleaning a lot easier. And speaking of cleaning, let's get started. I like to use a paintbrush to knock all the dust and filth loose. Then I go back over the entire machine with compressed air, blowing all the dust clear of the machine. And back inside, let's start with getting that CRT clean. A little glass cleaner and it shines right up. To tackle the switches and knobs, I like to spray a little simple green on them and then use an old toothbrush to scrub them. This really gets all the grime out of the small corners. It's actually a pretty sparse front panel with less than half the knobs and switches as the HP 150A, but it still took a bit of scrubbing to get everything nice and clean. On the top of the front panel here is what looks like tape from a sticker that fell off decades ago, and this is going to require a little mechanical work with a razor blade. It was tedious, but I eventually got it all clean without nicking the paint underneath. I'll use that same razor blade to tackle this little dot sticker that was on the front as well. And below that, there was yet another sticker saying bandwidth 450 khz, or kilohertz. The 120B is indeed a 450 kilocycle scope, so it's definitely limited, especially compared to the 150A, which is a 10 megacycle scope. So if we're doing any high frequency stuff, we'll have to use the 150A. But for most of the stuff I build, the 120B will be plenty. At any rate, I don't need a giant sticker on the front telling me the scope's max frequency, so let's remove that, and then give the entire front a spray down and wipe to clean it up. For the exposed aluminum handles and rails, I'm going to use a bit of steel wool and a lot of elbow grease to shine them up. This was a trick I learned polishing aluminum trim on cars. Steel wool gets it nice and clean, and then a once over with aluminum polish can really make it shine. I'm going to skip the polish here though, as the steel wool is doing an excellent job as it is. And while I have the steel wool out, I'll go through and clean up the bezel as well. It's an awkward shape, but after about 30 minutes of scrubbing, it started to look really good. Uh, next, let's address those scratchy switches. A little contact cleaner and a lot of rotations can get these working really nicely again. Finally, let's get those tubes we removed cleaned up. I am aware that wiping them down like this can remove the silk screen, but the tube number is often etched into the glass and won't come off, so I'm not concerned at all with losing the silk screen. At any rate, with the tubes all clean, let's pop them back in. And while doing this, I stumbled across something that's quite interesting. Cleaning's going well. This thing is shining up absolutely beautifully. It almost looks brand new, but uh, I made an interesting discovery. I was going through and repopulating all the tubes after wiping them down and cleaning them up. And there are like 18 tubes or something like that in here. Uh, and there are three 6U8s. The PCB says 6U8. The little diagram here on the underside of the top cover says 6U8. And uh, this particular one is a 6GH8. Now the 6U8 is a triode pentode, as is the 6GH8, and these are actually pin compatible. They're pretty similar tubes. You could totally use a 6GH8 in place of a 6U8, but I don't know if the triode and the pentode are close enough to be uh, essentially 100% interchangeable. Um, so that's interesting that this is not a 6U8. Um, well, I'm not super confident about putting this one back in here. This was obviously replaced at some point in time, and it just so happens that I have a boatload of 6U8 spares. So this is one of my spare 6U8s. I'm going to pop that in place of the 6GH8, and then all of the tubes will match exactly what is on the PCB and the diagram here. All right, let's see if I broke anything. The signal generator is on and should be mostly warmed up. So we'll go ahead and flip the power on for the uh, scope here. Let's see the power light has come on. The filaments are starting to warm up. That is excellent news. Oh, there we go. All right. All right, we definitely have some problems with the uh, vernier set to calibrate. Um, it should auto lock on, I believe, but I have to actually uh, rotate the vernier to get it to lock on and actually look like a sine wave. But the sine wave itself looks funky. You can see there's kind of this like 
mm, wavy pattern going on in the sine wave, and it is a little unstable. Um, so if, and if we adjust the vertical scale, the vertical scale changes massively. Might be able to bring that down. Oh yeah, look at that. That is a phenomenal amount of noise or something happening. I mean, the, <laughs> it looks super cool, but that is definitely not what we want to have happen. So this is gonna take a little more troubleshooting, but boy, we are really close. All right, it's time to do a little heavier troubleshooting. So I got the big 150A out and I've got the signal generator on generating a signal and it's going into both scopes. They both are set to exactly the same settings, which is uh, 20 microseconds per centimeter and 100 millivolts per centimeter. Um, this is what it should look like. The CRT on the 150A is gorgeous. And this is what we're getting. I don't know if I can get that dark enough for you guys to see. I've got the intensity turned up a bit, but it's not locking on and it's fading all over the place. So we're not getting a very clean looking image coming out of it. So there could be multiple failures here. My first instinct is to check the sweep generator. So on the schematic here, we can see that the trigger source comes in, goes through a trigger generator, uh, creates a bunch of different interesting square waves that go through start stop triggers and cathode followers. But ultimately what we care about is that we're generating a sawtooth. Uh, and so we can see that um, V205A here is a sawtooth generator. And this sawtooth pattern is going to be creating the uh, signal that's going to send the beam left to right across the scope. So this sawtooth is incredibly important and if it looks unstable or not correct uh, then we know that there's a problem there. Um, now we can check this sawtooth in multiple places but I want to check it at the very last stage. See if we have a clean sawtooth coming out of this. Uh, and if we look down here on the bottom we can see there's the sweep magnifier switch. That's this little times one times five switch here on the front which does seem to work. Uh, and if we follow that back, um, but I think R251 is going to be the easiest to check. It's got minus 150 volts on one side and it should have the sawtooth pattern on the other side of it. Uh, and so I'm going to pull the scope probe out of the uh, generator here and R251 is right here. So if I just touch the scope probe to that, so check that out. That is our sawtooth pattern that's being generated and that looks perfect. So obviously there's something else going on that we're gonna have to dig deeper into, but uh, at least our sweep generator is working correctly. All right, I may uh, insert my foot uh, squarely into my mouth here, but um, I was really perplexed in how this scope was behaving. If you look now, the uh, uh, sine wave that's coming into it looks great on it, but if I just change the frequency just a little bit, it completely freaks out. It's going bonkers. So I can actually like pop into and out of locking onto the signal and then losing it just by changing the frequency that's input into it. So I decided to check how it looks on the way into the sweep generator here. So if we look at the schematic here, there is a square wave coming into V201A here. And I actually have a scope probe on R201, the little 100 ohm resistor that's going into it, to check that square wave. Now I wanna check what the output of this trigger generator is. So I'm on C207 and C208. Uh, there's a little image of what that signal should look like. So I wanted to check the two of those. So that's what I've got on the scope here. This is uh, R201 and you can see that as I change the frequency, that looks pretty stable, even as this thing over here goes completely bonkers. Uh, but if I switch over to B here, that doesn't look very stable. I mean, yes, that is what the waveform should look like, mostly flat with spikes up and down. But as I change the frequency, it just goes all over the place. Sometimes I can get double frequency showing up. It's just really, really unstable. So, uh, I don't know, maybe there's a little more investigating that needs to go on here. So I'm going to look around the trigger generator circuit right here uh, and try to figure out why it's getting to be unstable. Maybe we've got a bad uh, passive in there or I don't know, maybe the uh, 6DG8 there isn't working quite right. I don't know, we'll uh, double check it and hopefully have better news here in a minute. All right, it's been like 
three days and we've just been chasing our tail like crazy. Uh, I got on uh, the Discord. I spent about six hours on Discord yesterday talking with like 10 people trying to troubleshoot this. And uh, the uh, sweep generator here has a giant feedback loop and we were testing all along that and we couldn't figure out where noise was making its way into this loop. We thought maybe there was some noise coming from the power supply. So we went over to the power supply and started doing some checking on that. And we ran down a rabbit hole with that, not realizing that the scope probe was causing a ground loop and creating some ripple. Uh, if we measured it correctly, there was no ripple. So the power supply is totally fine. Everything measures out perfectly over there. The problem is squarely located in the sweep generator. I was pretty much at my wits end and I came out late last night uh, and I was looking through and I noticed that one of the resistors looks different. Like it's been replaced at one point in time. One of them is a different color. It is uh, black instead of brown and uh, it measures out within spec. I mean, it's uh, orange, orange, yellow, so 330K and it measures to pretty much exactly 330K. Uh, except that it's not supposed to be 330K. I didn't realize that, but uh, looking at the schematic here, that is R222, and that shows as a 100 ohm resistor on the schematic here. Uh, most importantly, that's the resistor that goes to the grid of the 6C4. And I think that might be causing our problem here. Now, I have uh, started to kind of confirm that if I put it at just any situation where the scope is going bonkers. I have about 300 ohms of resistance here just because that's what I had laying around. I've got these jumper cables. So if I jumper across that, look at that, the scope locks on and it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. That's pretty close. And these jumper leads are coming from deep within the system all the way out over and it's the wrong resistance. Uh, so I think we need to desolder that resistor and replace it with a different one. Replace it with a proper 100 ohm resistor and then fire the whole thing up and see how it works from there. I've marked the resistor with two dots using a Sharpie, but there's something else interesting going on here. There's a white wire soldered directly to the grid of the 6C4. It spears off towards the front of the scope and it looks like it's capacitively coupled to the z-axis terminal that's on the front. That's very curious indeed because that is absolutely not how it's supposed to be connected. From what I can tell, three things have been modified here. As I said earlier, the grid of the 6C4 is directly connected to the z-axis through a capacitor. And I'm guessing that at the same time, the 100 ohm grid resistor was changed to a 330k ohm resistor. My theory is that this was to prevent the modified z-axis input from backfeeding into the rest of the circuit. Uh, now the z-axis input originally had a white wire from the high voltage circuit attached to it. It looks like it's capacitive coupled to the cathode of the CRT and when not in use the white wire is tied to ground using a grounding strap. On the actual machine though that white wire has been permanently soldered to ground by connecting it to the ground pins of one of the tubes. I have no idea why they would do this or what the goal of this overall modification was, but regardless, let's get it back closer to factory. Uh, I'll add some fresh solder to the pins of the resistor to make desoldering them easier. Then I'll grab my Radio Shack desoldering tool and get the solder off. I'll also remove this wire connected to the grid of the 6C4, and so it's not flopping around in the machine, I'll remove it from the capacitor as well. Interestingly, I think this is exactly what was causing our instability. That white wire was connected directly to the grid, and then it snaked along the bottom side of the PCBs, underneath the sweep generator, horizontal amplifier, and vertical amplifier, and everything else. My theory is that this wire was acting like a big antenna, and it was picking up some electromagnetic interference from the rest of the scope. Since the 6C4 is part of the feedback loop, that interference could have been feeding directly into the grid of this 6C4, causing the weird instability we were seeing. Either way, I'm moderately confident that this is our problem. 
All right, uh, weird modifications is probably something I should have noticed yesterday, but we've got the new uh, resistor in. I didn't have a 100 ohm half watt, so I took uh, two 220 ohm quarter watts and put them in parallel. Came out to 107 ohms, so that should be perfect. I've got uh, this scope set up to the exact same settings as this scope, the big boy scope here. That is uh, 100 millivolts per centimeter and 20 microseconds per centimeter. So we should see this same signal on both of these. Let's go ahead and flip the power on on this one. And it's gonna take it just a second for everything to warm up. Oh, here comes our signal climbing up from the bottom. That looks pretty much identical. So this one is going to be adjusted correctly, but I've touched every potentiometer in this. So my uh, height here is probably not correct. I'll have to readjust that. But uh, if I change the frequency here, that looks pretty good. It seems to just be locking on exactly how it's supposed to. But uh, boy, ah, oh, so close. We're not quite locking on there, but if I just touch it just a little bit. So that could just be a potentiometer setting. This is mostly working now. I would say we're like 98% of the way there. That is pretty awesome. I'm gonna clean up the uh, rest of the side covers and put it together so I can start poking around at it a bit more without worrying about dropping stuff in there. But yeah, that's awesome. It didn't actually take that much to bring this scope into alignment with this scope. I just mainly used this scope as a uh, baseline and then got this scope to match it perfectly. And a little bit of adjustment of the preset potentiometer in there seems to have made it behave correctly. You can see that as I move my signal generator here, this scope is updating perfectly. We're not getting any of that kind of weird triggering problems and it looks identical to the big 150A scope that's going on up there. So I am gonna go out on a limb and say that this little HP 120B is finished. We brought it back up and it is working perfectly. Once we uh, replaced the 330K ohm resistor that somebody had put in and we removed that wire, suddenly this whole thing started acting correctly. So. That was what got us on this one, a simple modification and a resistor change. But I am extremely happy that we've got it up, although that raises the next question of what am I gonna do with another oscilloscope? I have seven oscilloscopes and uh, having another one seems like a strange thing. Well, I really actually only have two vacuum tube oscilloscopes now. I have the big 150A and now I've got the 120B. All the rest of my scopes are transistorized. And so I think this is really exciting to have another vacuum tube oscilloscope, especially because this one has something that the 150A doesn't, and that is that it is rack mountable. So in my brain, I'm building up little builds about what to do, and I'm thinking that if I can find a uh, wide range oscillator, much like the 200 CV here, that is also rack mountable in this exact same format where it has these beautiful little uh, handles here. And if I can find a uh, vacuum tube voltmeter, again, in this exact same format that's rack mountable with the handles, I'll take the three of those, stack them up in a little roll around rack and have that become my mobile vacuum tube test equipment test cart for the Bendix G15. So that way I'm actually troubleshooting it using period correct equipment, but I can roll it around and not have to worry about it throwing my back out every time I need to move it like I have with the 150A. So if anybody has a line on a uh, vacuum tube wide range oscillator that's rack mount with this format or a vacuum tube voltmeter that's rack mount with this format, uh, sound off in the comments below, let me know. Maybe we can uh, figure out how to get that into my hands and we can build up our little roll around test cart. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed us flailing around trying to troubleshoot what was going on. I uh, was pulling my hair out for a little there, but I am over the moon now that this thing is working perfectly. Uh, so I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.